questions any commissioner may have about them. Again, it's been another busy month uh, for staff. Uh, one one uh, item under training on page three of the operations report. We're in the process of updating the figures. The figures now are the monthly count uh, for number of individuals who received lobbying training uh, in November was 57. The year to date total is 667. Commissioner Fisher. I have a quick question. Yeah, I see. Yes, Commissioner Brockett. Yeah, I've raised this before. I'm going to raise it again. Hopefully, at some point, I won't have to raise it. But on also on page three on the train, it says um, eight, eight, 1,843 individuals are overdue for ethics training. And, and then it says... That was as of October 14th, and then it says in the last column of the notes, it went up to 1896, October 21st. Last month, it was 1788. As of September 13th, it said, so it's gone up. I know that, <laughs> that this, in part, has to do with the agencies at which the individuals work. But why does the figure remain so large continually, month after month? It's ethics training for the for our state, for the state employees, uh, as well as us, and I've gone through mine, and I assume all the commissioners have, it's very important. Obviously, that's what we're all about. You know, my, my, my understanding is that that is a rolling total. So individuals come up for ethics training periodically, depending upon the cycle they were in and the months in which they originally took the training. Uh, after uh, coming into state service that, that requires them to take that training. Uh, and I, I, I think this is a, uh, a problem that, that persists, and it's a question of getting after them. I, I don't know if uh, 
uh, Keith St. John has anything to add on that on that subject. Let me just let me just interject that uh, I understand it's a it's a it's a monthly rolling total, but this total is for people who overdue. So why is it continued to be such a large total of individuals who are overdue for their training? So I send it back to you, Mr. Executive Director. If I might add, this is Keith St. John, uh, Deputy Director and, and uh, Deputy Counsel and, and Director of Ethics. Uh, as the judge, as, as Judge Berlin has indicated, uh, we seem to be maintaining, although nibbling away rather successfully, at a kind of normal 6% figure of employees across the state whose time period for the training, and these time periods uh, really go throughout the entire year, uh, but we tend to see at the end of the year as more people's uh, training deadlines now arise, uh, that figure uh, on its face may, may seem large, but in, in, uh, in consideration of uh, the statewide figures, uh, remains uh, relatively low. Uh, I would suggest that that first column, which indicates the number of lobby, uh, the number of individuals overdue as of October 14th, that October 14th date is probably uh, a mistake and, and, a, and should read November 14th, um, which would then make better sense of the fact that we've seen lower numbers in this report than we saw in last month's report. Uh, but the point being, the, the numbers are still you know, at the give or take 6% figure because of the rolling nature of, of these deadlines and the fact that towards the end of the calendar year, every year, more people come due than in any other time period in the, in the year, in the calendar year. But we continue to make uh, great efforts. Certainly our, our outreach and training unit uh, goes overboard to reach out to the ethics officers in the various agencies uh, particularly the academic institutions, where we tend to see uh, a contingent of overdue um, individuals. Does that satisfy your question, Commissioner Braun? Well, it answers my question. Uh, I'm sure we're, our staff is doing um, follow up continually, as has been said by Mr. St. John. But uh, one would hope that if more employees in the state got their training in a timely fashion, there'd be fewer ethical violations. And uh, it's, it's still somewhat assessing to see this figure of overdue individuals remain about the same. Um, so thank you. I appreciate the, the uh, your follow-up, Mr. St. John. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I believe Commissioner Fisher has a question as well. Commissioner Fisher. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, I wanted to ask about some of the items under ethics. So in particular, there's four of them, uh, of which there are uh, counts to date of more than 100. So there's total requests for guidance. So let me start there, and I just want to ask, um, of these 915, how many were responded to by staff, and approximately how many were brought to us for a vote? Uh, Keith, do you, do you have the breakdown? I, I don't have a, a specific breakdown, no, but uh, I, I would say that uh, the, the, the the vast majority of these uh, requests are disposed of uh, by either telephone guidance, email guidance, and only a hand few of them uh, are required to come before the full commission involving uh, statewide elected officials or heads of state agencies or uh, staff in the executive chamber, just a handful. All right, thank you. And 
these requests, are they documented and published and do we, um, are, are these considered to be confidential or these, are these? Yeah, the, I mean, the answer to that question is yes, they are confidential. They are, docu they are documented in our master log, a portion of which is uh, reported to commissioners every month by a uh, separate attachment. All right, but, but the details of who requested this guidance and what guidance was given, that's not uh, published. It is, it is confi confidential information under uh, Executive <laughs> Law uh, Section 9416, okay. and we maintain the confidentiality. The Commission does reserve the right uh, to publish uh, redacted copies, that, in other words, redacted to remove the identity or identifying information concerning the individual who made the request. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and again, the number of uh, uh, such requests that require commission action uh, are no more than uh, a few every month okay. at, at most. Thank you. Uh, with the post-employment, there are 322 of those. Um, remind me, if you will, of an example of a kind of post-employment um, inquiry that would be made and, and response that would be given? A very common situation is an individual who worked as an engineer or an inspector for the Department of Transportation, for example, uh, who has left state service and now wants to work for uh, an engineering firm or a highway construction firm. Okay. And he or she wants to know if uh, in accepting a position they're going to be violating any aspect of either uh, the so-called two-year bar or the lifetime bar. All right. Exactly. And do we maintain a list of these post-employment inquiries and do we publish them or is this information um, maintained in a confidential manner? The answer is yes. As to the first, we do maintain that information. Again, the, the advice that's provided uh, is confidential information under e Executive Law 9416. Okay. And again, the Commission does reserve the right to publish uh, these guidances in redacted form, that is, removing identifying information. Gotcha. Uh, the next one with a, a big count is the outside activity. So I think we're pretty familiar with that from having some of those come to us, and there might have been a half dozen or ten since we changed the policy on that. But the other uh, 230 apparently or so um, were responded to by staff. Um, and may I ask, uh, do we have a list of the people that asked for approval of outside activity, and do we publish that list, and do we publish the responses that are given? or are those maintained uh, confidential, uh, confidentially? It's, it's, it's the same answer. We, we maintain a list, uh, and uh, we do not publish the guidances, although, again, uh, the Commission does reserve the right to, produce, to publish uh, guidances in redacted form, removing identifying information. Okay. And the last one I want to ask about, also over 100, 106 of them, conflict of interest. So that's when there's a potential conflict of interest where someone's subject to our jurisdiction, and I think there's a couple hundred thousand people that fall into that bucket. Um, yes, over 200,000. They will seek, State employees. They will State seek employees. guidance from us about whether something is a, con a conflict of interest. Um, I don't remember any coming to us, uh, so I'll, I'll assume that all 106 were handled by staff, and I'll ask the same question. Um, do we have a list? Do we publish the list of who sought guidance about conflict of interest? And do we publish uh, the, the resolutions of the questions that folks have about co potential conflict of interest? Yeah, again, we, we maintain a list of all inquiries that come in uh, and of our responses. Uh, we do not, again, uh, we do not pu publish uh, because of the confidentiality requirement of Section 9416 of the executive law, but again, the commission does reserve the right to publish in redacted form. Okay, and, and when I add these four categories up, there's uh, more than 1,500 uh, already year to date, and I assume that year to date means through November, something like that, so over 1,500 of these, uh, fewer than a dozen that I can remember coming to us, and the other 1,500 plus uh, handled by staff. I think it's 915. You, yeah, the, the top the top figure, 72 total requests this month, and 915 year to yeah. date. So, so if you add the subcategories, it adds yeah, up to so 915. Yeah, so there's over 1,500 of these 
Does the court? I'm sorry, you're double counting. It's 915. The 915 is the total. Oh, 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 I see. So these are the categories under the 915. Yes. I got it. So maybe 15 came to us. Maybe there are 900 in these various categories. I gotcha. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Gershman. Um, yes, I just have a brief chair, uh, qu question, Mr. Chair, um, for staff, and that is, can you remind us, please, what the penalty is for failure to either file the FDS or for failure to take the ethics training? So uh, there is no statutory penalty for failing to take ethics training. Um, and in terms of the FDS, uh, it's a, uh, an amount not to exceed $10,000 for uh, failure to file an FDS. So with respect to the ethics training, is that left for each of the individual agencies to impose whatever um, sanctions or penalties that they wish for failure to, to take the ethics training? It's not spelled out as such, but that would be the, re the reality of it, as there is no penalty uh, authorized by JCO. And, and do we routinely report to the agencies the list of individuals who have failed to take the ethics training? Yes, we do. We, we uh, notify not only the uh, delinquent trainee, but we also notify the ethics officer for the respective agency, as well as their appointing authority, I believe. So it's done basically by CCing the agency, or do we do a monthly total to the agency of the following individuals um, have are delinquent in their ethics training? My understanding is that we copy the, the relevant uh, uh, personnel, both the ethics officer and appointing authority. We copy them on the notice that we uh, generate to the employee. Uh, I wonder if it would be helpful to also um, uh, ask them for their assistance and by giving them uh, a list of all of the individuals within their agency who have failed to take the ethics training. I'm, I'm rather confident that that is already being done. Uh, Thank com you. Commissioner Gersman, I, I apologize. I was mixing up violations in my head. It's up to $40,000, not 10000 My mistake. Failure to file an FDS. Thank you. I have another question. Just to be, um, I just, this is Monica Sam. I just want to clarify that each agency has access to the database where they can see their filers and their training status, and there's close coordination between our training staff and the agency ethics offices on this subject. And then we also report statistical information annually in our annual report. And, and do you know of any of these agencies that routinely do anything uh, sanction-wise against any of their employees who, who don't take the ethics training? I'm, I'm not aware of them disciplining staff for not taking the training. I think their priority is to get them trained. And one of the issues here is that they do trainings periodically. So someone may be deficient in their training, but they're not going to have a training just for that one person. So they're going to schedule a training, you know, in the next month or two to get as many people trained as possible. So there's somewhat of a lag, I think, in some of what goes on. Um, and th that might be some of the issue for why the numbers continue to be high for a month or two. Um, and then there's also, you know, with remote staff, that every, every agency over the past few years has been figuring out how to do all of this virtually and track it virtually. Um, and then we also held regular trainings that they can take. But I'm not aware of any agency that focuses on discipline for not taking the training. I think their goal is getting people trained and compliant. That doesn't mean that it's not happening. We're just, I'm just not aware. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sanzan, I have a question. Uh, do we ask for any explanations from the heads of the agency or uh, other executives of the agency as to why uh, these numbers are high or why there are even uh, sufficient training occurring in the agency, why there are still outstanding training, uh, ethics training uh, requirements? I, I believe so. Again, uh, the, the staff, um, deputy director for training, as well as our training uh, associates, they are in virtually constant contact with the ethics officer, officers to not only bring the numbers down, but find out sort of why the bottleneck exists and how we may 
we, we may be able to support their efforts, their primary efforts, in uh, delivering the trainings that are required. Do we ever elevate the, um, this, uh, this whole procedure process to the executive of the agency, the, um, the head of the agency? Again, I think the uh, appointing authorities, which would presumably be those high-ranking uh, executive officials or officers, they are uh, put on notice as well when we see uh, delinquencies that uh, need to be addressed. Uh, are those the responses in writing, or do we just, is it more colloquial where it's the phone call? I believe it's in writing. The correspondence is electronic. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Braun, have another question? Commissioner Braun, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Bursman um, anticipated the area that I was going to ask about uh, before she spoke, and that is in relation to FDS, the chart says that <laughs> there were 17 notices of delinquency issued, and as of November 16th, uh, thanks to staff work, I'm sure 11 have been filed, so there's still six outstanding. My question is, without getting into the details of the six, what generally, how, how are those six being approached to make sure that the um, FDSs are filed and the populations are appropriate, and I, I would guess they come before us? I would not want to equate our efforts to uh, those annoying robocalls that people get on their cell phones all the time, but, but we, uh, we've got a very dedicated staff that uh, goes to every length, both by email and telephone, to chase down these uh, delinquent filers. So that is an ongoing process uh, that, uh, that we dedicate a lot of resources uh, towards. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? All right, moving on to item four. I, I did want to say, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. we, we did conduct uh, our annual uh, continuing le legal education program in conjunction with New York Law School this past month. It was on the question uh, or the issue of the intersection between land use regulation and uh, lobbying regulation. It was attended by about 200 individuals. Uh, we had uh, a panel that kind of covered the, the range of activity both within New York City and outside New York City uh, on this important issue. Uh, the discussion was a robust one. Uh, I, I know that a couple of uh, our, our commission members uh, attended. Uh, we found it extremely informative and because we are um, intending to issue some further guidance in the area, it was extremely helpful. Uh, to us, uh, both in information gathering and in, in educating uh, the regulated community uh, and the community that participates in land use uh, regulation activities in the, in the intersection of those two areas of law. So I just wanted to point that, that out. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anything else on operations? Uh, nothing from staff at this time. Thank you. Very good. You and other business. Anything on you and other business? Uh, yes, Chair uh, David McNamara here. I'd like to uh, move to adopt the final resolution, which I will read for the benefit of the commissioners. By virtue of the authority vested in the Joint Commission on Public Ethics, which will be referred to as the Commission, under New York Executive Law, Section 94, Subsection 15 and 17, the Commission resolves as follows. Whereas, by J. Cope Resolution 21-03, the Commission revoked the conditional approval letter. And I'll note that the fine terms, as I read them, are uh, as used in Resolution 2103. Whereas, as a consequence of the revocation of the conditional approval letter, Governor Cuomo lacked legal authority to engage in outside activity and receive compensation with regard to the book, while 
and sent by the state of New York, and whereas Governor Cuomo received and retained compensation from the publisher of the book, and whereas in the absence of Jacob's approval of his outside activity in connection with the book, Governor Cuomo is not legally entitled to retain compensation paid to him in any form for his outside activities related to the book, and whereas as counsel for the state of New York, the Attorney General of the state of New York is vested with the legal authority to take the action specified in herein. Now, therefore, it is resolved that it is hereby ordered that by no later than 30 days from the date of this resolution, Governor Cuomo pay over to the Attorney General of the state of New York an amount equal to the compensation paid to him for his outside activities related to the book. And it is further resolved that in the event that Governor Cuomo fails to make timely payment as ordered, enforcement of such order is hereby referred to the Attorney General. And it is further resolved that the manner of the distribution of the funds to be paid to the Attorney General as ordered above is hereby referred to the Attorney General with the intent that the Attorney General determine the identity of the appropriate recipient of the book proceeds under the law and distribute funds accordingly. Motion would require discussion with regards to matters that we have to discuss in, in the executive session. Um, so I'm going to uh, move to go into executive session to discuss the resolution uh, and the other related matters. Do we have a second on that motion? Um, before you do, Mr. Chair, uh, and I apologize for not doing this in advance, but I wonder if Commissioner McNamara would accept a friendly amendment to the resolution in that well, under the under the initial uh, determination of uh, Jacob uh, revoking the approval, uh, there was an opportunity for Governor Cuomo to reapply for that approval. Uh, there was a, a specified period of time in which to do so, and uh, there should be, in my opinion, a resolve clause that he did not uh, do so. I, I'm going to ask that we discuss the resolution and all the matters related to all the resolution in the executive session. I have uh, Commissioner Weissman as the second to move into executive session. Do I have a vote? Do I have in favor? Say aye. No. Chair, I did not move to move. I did not second to move to an executive session. I did second to move the resolution. Okay. Well, I'm asking that the rest. I'm asking that we never have a discussion to the resolution or after we go I'm asking that who's in favor a second on moving with the executive session. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Levine. Yes, thank you. Is it your intention, Mr. Chair, to return to the public session for a vote on Commissioner McNamara's resolution? That will be part of this member. And exactly. So, uh, unless you assure us that we will return to the public session for the disposition, I will not vote in favor of going into executive session. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Bruin. Commissioner Bruin. You know, I, 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 along the lines of what Commissioner Levine just said. Um, this, the revocation motion had come up previously, previous to when it was approved, and it was not, it, uh, was not supported by eight commissioners. It was supported by seven. It's my opinion that if certain commissioners didn't have to leave for each for their own reasons, that resolution would have passed and would have, the revocation would have taken place early. I was one of the seven who voted for the resolution to revoke the first time as well as the, the, sorry, the second time as well as the time it was revoked subsequently. Um, <clears throat> my fear is that if we go to executive session now and then we don't take the vote until the public session after the entire long executive session there's a long agenda that may happen that certain commissions might have to leave and we might not have enough to vote. Uh, therefore, the only way I would support this motion uh, is that 
uh, we would go immediately back to executive session to take the vote after we discuss this as the first item of the executive session. So, therefore, uh, whatever can be that has to be discussed in confidentiality could be discussed in executive session. Uh, otherwise, I would say we should take it up now, and if anything can be discussed, it's not confidential, do so, and then take a vote without discussion uh, being brought up as anything confidential. I think I would only support the motion if we, were, if the agenda is amended that this will be the first item in the second session, and then we'll go immediately back to public session to vote on it, and then return to the executive session for all the other items already on the agenda. Thank you, Norther. If that's a motion, I second that. That's a motion. Thank you. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. What are we, what are we voting on? We, there are two motions on the table, I believe. I was going to see the I made and there was a second on commission and let's take the vote on the motion. Could, could I ask, uh, this uh, Commissioner Fisher, could I ask for the motion to be read, please? I have a motion to move this discussion to executive session with the understanding that it will be handled on the top of that agenda and then return to public session to handle this immediately thereafter. Is that correct? The only additional thing is then we go back, back to executive session. If we finish with the public session here, we go to executive session for the rest of the executive session agenda. Yes, that's correct. Point of order: Where will the vote? Where will the vote on Commissioner McNamara's resolution take place? In the public session. Okay, thank you very much. And the resolution should so state. That's my, that was my intent of the resolution. To include that. And I agree, Commissioner Braun, but it was not read by uh, Deputy General Counsel Levine. Are we able to take a vote now? I, could we have the resolution read, please? The resolution or the motion? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. The motion. The, the text of the motion. It, it sounds like it sounds like the text of the motion that was read is not satisfactory, and it seems as though you're asking for Martin to to change the motion from what he read. Okay, as I understand it, it is to move immediately to executive session to take up the discussion of the proposed resolution to return immediately to public session to vote on the proposed resolution in public session to return back to executive session to handle the remainder of that agenda. Well, one other thing, and that is returning to the executive session to vote on Commissioner McNamara's resolution and the amendment, if not accepted as friendly, or if accepted as friendly by Commissioner McNamara, that being the amendment made by Commissioner Gersman, um, then that would be included in the, in the resolution. So upon return to public session, there will be consideration of the amendment as well as the resolution if the amendment, regardless of whether the amendment is adopted. Is that correct? That's my motion. Great. That's included in my motion. I don't know if there's a second on the record to the, to the motion as so phrased. Second. Are we taking a vote? I think so, yes. All in favor. Uh, Levine, Braun, DePiro, McNamara, Jacob. Yates, Henrys, Gersman. So what's the count there? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Nine in favor. Oh, motion carries. Do we get the vote you now? Gotta, you got to take the, the other count. 
all of Fisher. Let me see Fisher. Thank you. All right. I guess people can vote. It's fine. Let's. It carries. People voted. Wanted. Wanted to vote. Voted. Okay. Stand by, please. Mr. Chairman, who is in the negative? Chair and the others, um, I have one question for you, and then I'd like to make a comment, if that's possible. <clears throat> um, it, it's a matter of public uh, record and knowledge that we have an ongoing investigation in this matter. Is it your understanding that that investigation will uh, now end, given our action, uh, ordering the governor to pay over the proceeds from his uh, authoring of a book to the attorney general? resolution uh, was presented for the first time in the 90th. 
We've had no opportunity to consult with staff as to what the results and, and consequences would be. You know, you're asking me if the reported uh, pending matters uh, of this commission uh, with regards to the seven outside activity will continue uh, after this resolution. I, 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 I would assume so. I've not had an opportunity to discuss that with staff. Uh, unfortunately, the way this resolution was presented, it does not allow for any deliberative process and, uh, you know, cooperation with the commissioners or the staff. So uh, it would be a guess that that, that the investigation is more uh, at the point of uh, thank you. Um, this is my statement as to how I plan to vote. This commission almost certainly lacks the authority to issue the order at the heart of this resolution. Even after discussion and executive session of various interesting legal theories, I am unaware of any statutory basis for this order, nor are there any precedents in our past to guide us. I believe strongly that our actions should be based on clearly established legal authority, but this order to pay proceeds from authoring a book over to the Attorney General has no such basis. Therefore, I will vote against Commissioner McNamara's resolution. Any other discussion or comments? has gone on the table and discussed openly for at least two prior meetings. It's been around for at least three months. Um, I'm shocked, shocked to hear that staff hadn't looked into it or even thought about it. I was disappointed to hear that, um, uh, to hear uh, Commissioner Fisher felt that he had never received any information uh, about this when he really should have. That's not what I said. Now, the other, okay, withdrawn as to that part. I don't want to speak for you, Commissioner Fisher. But there's something that should be known, and that is uh, we have a history, a number of commissioners on this commission, of complaining about investigations that have lingered for one, two, even three years. Um, so um, I'm sure none of us want to be in the position uh, where that attains once again. This has been on the table for a couple of months, and I'm, I'm proud to vote for Commissioner McNamara's resolution. Thank you. Commissioner Wong. Well, I first saw this <coughs> resolution, although the wording has been somewhat changed. I first saw it last evening. Uh, Certainly, it would have been better to have been given more notice, but this happens at times. It happens fairly often with this commission and other entities at meetings. It's entirely appropriate to first raise an issue at the meeting, even if it's preferable to give earlier notice. So there's nothing wrong as a matter of process. First sending the cause resolution around last evening. Uh, as for the merits, we've already decided at our last meeting to revoke the permission for the book deal that Mr. Governor had received earlier uh, upon uh, a uh, single acting co-executive director giving approval in between commission meetings. Uh, as to a hearing and a further investigation, whether it takes place or not is, uh, is on the side. We've already revoked. There's no need for determination by an investigation and a hearing officer as to that that's done. What's left is what the remedy will be or how a remedy would be handled. That's Commissioner McNamara's motion. It would be certainly inequitable for us to revoke approval of the governor's book deal 
and for him to still keep the funds. As pointed out in the resolution, he hasn't applied uh, to us for further approval or approval by the commission. We've never done that. I wasn't a member at the time, but the commission did not approve it. Uh, it was approved, as I said, by staff. Uh, it would be highly inequ inequitable for him to keep this very large sum of money. Now, theoretically, the book publisher could ask for, and if not given, sue to get the money back. Uh, but let's say the book publisher, for whatever reason, decided not to do that, and we didn't in go forward with any remedy. That would mean that Governor Cuomo, former Governor Cuomo, would be keeping this <laughs> $5 million. We've revoked. There should be a remedy. I support the resolution of Commissioner, Commissioner McNamara to state a remedy by the commission. Any other comments? On the resolution, I'll call the roll. Judge Braun. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner DePiro. Yes. Commissioner Fisher. No. Commissioner Gerstmann. Yes. Judge Inrix. Yes. yes. Commissioner Jacob. Yes. Commissioner Levine. Yes. Judge McCarthy. Yes. Commissioner McNamara. Yes. Commissioner Weissman. Yes. Judge Yates. Yes. Chair Nieves. Motion carries. We are have a motion to can I have a motion to return to executive session to continue the work of the commission and the Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. That's Commissioner Lyon. I believe we are still in the open session portion, new and other business. I have two motions to make. I believe we closed that already. And we were only going to reopen for the specific vote of the uh, of the resolution. That was the resolution when we went in. That was my understanding when we came out of the executive session. Is it the ruling of the chair that I cannot make two motions at this juncture of the meeting? I would call up, I would call those resolutions out of order. But I feel the ruling of the chair. All right, so may I ask the chair, may I ask the chair to address the commission? The resolution that was the, the resolution that was passed before we went into executive session was to return to open session for the specific purpose of voting on the resolution of Commission Act. We did that. I'm not sure why we asked the reopening of the the open session. In full scope. Commissioner Lincoln, the chair, then, then explain to me that why, why that wasn't the case. I, I will explain where I stand on it, which should answer your question. First of all, I never understood going in to executive session to vote and then to return immediately meant that we were closing the open session, because as you well know, because I sent you this on December 9th, well in advance of this meeting, and you acknowledged it, I had a motion to make. I distributed the motion to all commissioners. I clearly stated in that motion days ago that it would be made in public session. How you now assume that I agreed to go into executive session and close down the public session before this motion was heard, I cannot understand. Commissioner Jacob, may I? Yes. And Mr. Chair? 
It was my motion. It was my motion to go into executive session. It was specifically for the purpose of <coughs> discussing Commissioner McNamara's motion, then returning to the public session for a vote. There was nothing in my motion that said it was to end the public session, and there was nothing in my motion to say that any <laughs> old or new business could not be addressed subsequent to our disposing in some fashion uh, of Commissioner McNamara's motion. Um, therefore, certainly, in my view, the maker of the motion that sent us to, sent us to executive session there's nothing uh, to bar Commissioner Levine or commi and or Commissioner, um, uh, I forget, who else made the motion? Jacob. Jacob. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Sorry. Um, there's nothing to bar them from bringing up under new business any additional matters that uh, would be appropriate in that category. All right. So the point of clarification from Commissioner Vaughn will uh, remain in open session uh, for the purpose of receiving a resolution. So, Commissioner Levine, you can come answer your resolution. You're on mute. I believe that Commissioner Jacob has a resolution also. I'll defer to him first. Go ahead, Commissioner Jacob. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Commissioner Levine. As I stated, on December 9th, I circulated to all commissioners and to the chair a motion in which I stated that in public session on December 14th, I would ask the commission to approve this motion. And the motion deals with transparency with confidentiality under Section 9A of the Executive Law. Hopefully you've all received my email. In order to be as brief as possible on this, having spent so much time on the prior resolution, I will go right to the point. There's been a great deal of criticism lodged against Jacob for years and only recently on the subject of transparency, the Senate hearing several days ago. We're too secretive. This motion hopefully addresses that that problem, and it has been a problem having been on this commission since inception, I can tell you it's been a problem since inception. And since inception, we've been talking about the issue that underlies this motion. We've spoken about it in confidentiality committee, but we've been talking for years This is a motion that, that is attempting to move these theoretical discussions into concrete action. So I hereby move as follows. Give me one moment. By law, the commission is required to establish procedures necessary to prevent unauthorized disclosure of information we receive. At a recent meeting, the commission determined that this should be done by promulgation of rules after posting and receipt of public comment. The Confidentiality Subcommittee has been in existence for almost two years and has not come to agreement on proposed regulations or the issues dealt with in this regulation, in this rule, proposed rule. 
In the name of reform and transparency, we should now vote to direct staff to prepare regulations for publication and promulgation as follows. Pursuant to Executive Law 94, 9-A, the Commission by majority vote of the full Commission may disclose to any person or entity outside the Commission any testimony or information obtained by a Commissioner or staff. Disclosure so authorized may be by full public release or to designated persons or entities as directed by the Commission. The Commission may further direct that disclosure to designated persons or entities be conditioned upon promises of confidentiality or agreement to limit further discussion. I know there's a good deal in that motion, and that is why I have circulated it to all commissioners. Unfortunately, it was not put in your books, but you do have the email that I sent to you. So I hereby move that the commission vote in the affirmative on this motion. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Brown, second. Yeah, I'd like to speak to it. Is there going to be open discussion in open session? Is there going to be a open session or are we going to executive, given the confidentiality committee work? I have nothing I'm going to say is confidential. Nothing I've said is confidential. Go ahead, Commissioner Brown. Yeah. Um, well, firstly, I believe very strongly in transparency in government, and that includes this commission. Uh, we are limited in what we can say, we're greatly limited in what we can say without permission. I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> and that's by virtue of the statutory scheme that was established by the legislature when they set up the commission. Um, it's not for me to tell what the legislature what to do, but, but I think that they should re-examine that. Uh, in any event, 9A, 9-A, uh, as cited to by Commissioner Jacob, says, I'm going to read it, it's very short. Any, and I, I add my own emphasis to the word any, confidential communication to any person or entity outside the commission required, I'm uh, sorry, related to the matters before the commission may occur only as authorized by the commission. I interpret that to mean that we, the commission, <laughs> can vote at any time to authorize a commissioner to speak or in, any, in some way reveal uh, matters before the commission. Uh, therefore, I'm certainly in favor of this motion, and I think it's a very wise idea of Commissioner Jacob to uh, have the staff propose regul a regulation to this effect so that we can then interpret it if it comes before us. But I think at any time, by statute, we can vote to authorize a commissioner to uh, speak as to pu uh, publicly as to a matter that's before the commission. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Levine. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. On the motion. Over the decade-long existence of the Commission, we have been treated to exhortations by the Cuomo cohort that confidentiality is paramount, that we've taken an oath to uphold confidentiality, that we risk litigation exposure if we don't elevate confidentiality to the utmost. These high-tone exhortations had as their object institutionalizing Jacob as a star chamber. The medieval English star chamber court started out as a good idea that was corrupted by the monarch. It functioned in secret to serve the monarch, not justice. Its abuses led Parliament to abolish it. Jacob started out as a good idea that was suborned and subverted during the former administration. Jay Cope will shortly meet the same end as the Star Chamber, 
at the hands of the new governor and the legislature. The least we can do on our exit is to vindicate the proposition of openness, which the Court of Appeals has consistently held is a presumption. I support the motion. Commissioner Fisher. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I haven't made up my mind on this one. I have a couple of questions, um, but before I ask them, I'd like to commend uh, Commissioner Jacob, um, first of all, for circulating this in advance. It did give us an opportunity to review it. Uh, I had the opportunity to reach out to the General Counsel and have her answer some questions that I had. Um, I also wanted to commend his work on the uh, Record Ac Records Access Committee, uh, Confidentiality and Records Access Committee, um, although he and I haven't agreed on every detail in general, uh, we've agreed on a lot, and I believe his uh, beliefs are strongly held, and I, I support that and appreciate his work. Um, my question is, if there are some concerns um, that I have about risks, um, this, this is not a policy that will go into effect, but rather regulations that will be publicized, I believe, and the, the real question I have is, uh, is it appropriate as a commissioner um, to comment um, on um, regulations after they've been put out, or do I need to um, make my comments now, I guess? Are you asking me, Commissioner? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I guess I should be asking General Counsel Stam. That's what I think. I'm sorry. I mean, I think commissioners will have, you have an opportunity to comment now, but you also will have an opportunity when the regulations are presented to the commission, which they would be first be presented to the committee, and then they'd be presented to the commission. All the commissioners would have an opportunity at that time when they're being considered in, um, to move forward on a rulemaking um, to have input into what the, the regulations would say then as well. Okay. Uh, in light of that, I'm going to withhold my comments about the risks um, that I see with this, and um, I'll support this resolution. Commissioner Weissman. Uh, I have a question for Commissioner Jacob, uh, since he's requesting a rulemaking, and whether or not he would consider as a friendly amendment that this rulemaking be done on an emergency basis. As you know, emergency basis rules can stay in effect only 90 days. And uh, you, sh you wish to make, suggest a friendly amendment that what I'm proposing as rulemaking go into effect immediately. I, I have no problem with that simply because I believe Judge Braun's interpretation of Section 9-A is correct. I've said it for a long time. That is not to say that it is entirely free from doubt because there are others who say otherwise. I believe Judge Braun is correct. Section 9A clearly states that we have, as commissioners, the discretion in the public interest to disclose what, in our view, by a majority vote, that is, what in our view should be disclosed in the public interest. So I have no problem with your friendly amendment. Uh, if I may, Commissioner Jacob, as you know, and I think Judge Braun has, has also learned, you and I have had this, taken this same position uh, from almost the beginning of the commission. So at this point, it seems imperative to me that we get this done as quickly as possible. And for anybody who's really concerned, asking the question as to whether or not this would fit into the emergency uh, provisions of SAPA, under that, under those, uh, st under the statute and the regulations, is a general welfare provision. And transparency in government is, a ge is, is of general welfare to the citizens of the state of New York. So. I, I thank you very much for accepting the friendly amendment. 
Mr. Wells. So just, um, this is General Counsel Sam, and I just want to clarify, there aren't actually regulations before the commission at this time. There's just a motion to direct staff to develop those regs. So I just want to clarify, Commissioner Weissman, you're saying that when those regs are ultimately presented to the commission in January, that they would be considered by the commission to be adopted on an emergency basis? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you. Chair, can I ask a question? Does that mean there's not any comment period? Correct. There wouldn't be a comment period on that, but if the commission wants to adopt the regs permanently on a parallel track, then there would be a comment period on that, which is I assume what the, reg what the commission would want to do is proceed with both, like a, a full rulemaking and then adopt them on an emergency basis as well. <clears throat> yes, and I, I, and I believe, as uh, Commissioner Jacob pointed out, they're only in effect for 90 days while we go through the uh, notice and comment rulemaking. Any other uh, comments or questions? Commissioner Henrich. Yes, thank you. Uh, at the October meeting, we had uh, decided that we were going to make regulations and propound regulations with a view towards more transparency that everybody is obviously in favor of. I would just like to inquire what the status of that was from two months ago, because I think it ties into Commissioner Jacobs' motion here. I think uh, based on my participation in the committee, we've met twice uh, with regard to the direction given by the full commission uh, we scheduled a January meeting where staff was going to present draft regulations and standards, and then uh, we were going to look at that and then present it to the full board and go through the entire rulemaking process, with, which includes the public comment. So that is the status as to the committee, uh, which is due to meet in January for the proposed uh, regulations. Thank you. That's the question. Any other comments? I, I would raise a concern regards to the uh, resolution. Uh, my concern is that uh, by requiring a vote of eight for disclosure of information, you're basically uh, making it less transparent. Um, I was hoping that through the rulemaking process with the committee, the confidentiality committee, we would be able to establish uh, automatic disclosures uh, both to the complainants, to the witnesses, uh, interested witnesses, as well as the subject of the investigation. These, these uh, you know, automatic rules would, would have allowed individuals by request only to gain uh, information that they were interested in. Um, by this resolution, you're requiring that eight commissioners have to approve release of the information. And further in the resolution, you basically say, not only do you have to approve it by eight commissioners, but that they condition the release and the dis dis dissemination of that information. And it seems to me that that is not Transparency. I mean, if we really want to have uh, an open process where individuals have access to information, why are we requiring a vote of eight commissioners before that process can begin? Um, as I stated uh, with Commissioner Henrich's question, uh, and as stated in the resolution, we agreed to go through the rule rulemaking pro uh, process in October, and we've already met twice, and we are actually uh, going to receive draft regulations and then January. So why are we now preempting the entire process and going straight to the rule and, and policy and all that, uh, you know, for clarification on that? May I? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry. Me? Um, if it, to the chair, if your interpretation were correct, I might agree with you, but you have to think about it in terms of the statute and the proposed regulation. The proposed regulation under current law and the practice, um, 
confidential information obtained by the commission is not released except in certain circumstances. This expands it to say confidential information can be released pursuant to a vote and the guidance of the commission, which is what the statute says. Nothing in the resolution or the intent of the resolution or the statute says that things that were previously released can continue to be released. Now, if that's a little bit confusing to you from the way the proposed language from Commissioner Jacobs in the resolution was presented, I'm sure, I'm positive that the staff, when they actually deal with the technicals of drawing up the resolution, will go ahead and make sure that this is only expanding the possibility of transparency and not limiting the available information that the public has today. I'm sure that's Commissioner Jacobs' intent, and I'm sure staff is quite capable of drafting the regulation to follow through on that intent. The bottom line here is that you're basically saying that release of information can occur with the vote of eight commissioners. Outside of the vote of eight commissioners, that information cannot be released. I mean, that's my simple review of the resolution. Is there other conditions, requirements, or, you know, that I'm missing? Yes. Yes, you are. Because the statute, the statute is confusing, which is why we need the regulations and why having staff prepare regulations pursuant to the intent expressed by Commissioner Jacobs makes eminent good sense. The statute at one point says, except as otherwise required or provided by law, testimony or any other information obtained by the commissioner or staff shall not be disclosed by any such individual or to any person or entity outside the commission during the pendency of a matter. That's the existing law. That's inconsistent with one of the lines, two lines further down in the same paragraph, that says that the commission can authorize disclosure of confidential information by a majority vote. So having served on the confidentiality subcommittee for two and a half years, we've gone around and around and around and around because of those two apparently inconsistent lines. If you read the first line, there are people who say any information obtained by the commission cannot be disclosed. If you read the later line, it says that information can be disclosed by a majority vote. So what Commissioner Jacobs' resolution says is we're clarifying to say, yes, if you have a majority vote, you can release information. It's not, there's nothing right now under current law that we're releasing publicly that would be limited by doing that. It's just a way of getting around the two inconsistent lines, the first line which would seem to say that we can't release anything. And I'm sure staff is quite capable of taking care of your concerns, Mr. Chair. Any other comments or questions? Commissioner Fisher. Thank you, Attorney Evans. Your comments raise something in my mind. When we vote, there have been occasions in which commissioners have expressed a need to consult with their appointing authority. As an example, when we, prior to voting on the next executive director, there was a discussion around whether it was appropriate to consult with the appointing authority on the appointment. And I felt it wasn't appropriate, but other, at least one other commissioner felt it was. What I'm going to do is support this, but ask staff to draft an amendment to our code of ethics requiring disclosure of any conversations between commissioners and their appointing authority with respect to an upcoming vote, including this vote to disclose information. And I think that would further transparency. And if commissioners did feel a need to consult with their appointing authority about an upcoming vote on this sort of disclosure, then the other commissioners would at least know about that as well as the public. So that's something that I'll be doing after this meeting. And 
uh, chair hopefully uh, receive your blessing to, to put it on the agenda in January. Okay. Any further? Uh, well, I, I actually have a question for uh, the general counsel, general counsel Sam, if uh, she can explain uh, the concerns that, that, that I've seen regards to uh, whether this type of resolution will create any issues with our law enforcement partners that share information with us regards to pending investigations. Uh, the point I'm making is once we pass this resolution, then any information, whether investigative or otherwise, can be released with the vote of the eight commissioners, uh, the any commissioners who arbitrarily decide this is necessary can release that information and, and thereby releasing potential information of investigation of a law enforcement agency outside of ourselves. Uh, that being the case, law enforcement agencies, because they're usually confidential, would uh, be very reluctant to share information uh, with another agency if they believe that that information would be released uh, without their without their consent or at least their consultation. So I would ask the commission, um, General Counsel Sam, mm -hmm. if you can uh, uh, opine on that. I, mean, I, I guess you basically stated the, the exact concern, which has come up repeatedly over the course of the last 10 years. Um, if, if it is well understood that um, by a vote of eight commissioners, information can be disclosed um, without any, there's no, there's no apparent standard for what would it would take to be able to make that disclosure. Um, we are going to not have a great cooperative relationships with the you know, federal prosecutors who right now are willing to share some information with us, um, as well as um, other law enforcement partners and other agencies that we are constantly working closely with. They're not going to be inclined to share privileged information with us um, or, or keep us apprised of what they're doing if that information could be publicly disclosed by eight commissioners and, and there's no standards or controls for that. We, we often get cooperation and, and these are this isn't you know hypothetical I, I it, within the last month I've had multiple conversations with agencies wanting assurances about whether or not when they share something out with us it would be kept confidential um, that is to your direct point about um, law enforcement and the other partners that we work with when we conduct our investigations um, another issue is you know frequent questions from complainants and witnesses about whether or not their roles and identities will be kept confidential um, and we won't be able to offer them any assurances um, about that if by a vote of eight commissioners without any standards the commission can just make this information public. I, I don't know what that will do to complainants who come to us expecting confidentiality, um, but it, certainly it's a conversation we have with witnesses that we want to cooperate with us all the time. <coughs> So would you, would you say that, that would impede our ability to do the investigations that we have to do for these allegations of the violation of law? Because that would actually work against the, the work of the agents. Yeah, yes, that's what I would expect. I think that there will be, um, that this will impede our ability to do those kind of things. Um, I, I think you know, what, we, what staff had undertaken, what I, my understanding from the committee call earlier this week was that we were going to set this out in a regulation with standards and procedures <clears throat> for what would be disclosed and how it would be disclosed and when it would be disclosed, um, rather than that it could just be disclosed by a vote of um, eight commissioners. I agree with uh, Judge Yates. Staff can certainly undertake to do that, but I thought that we were we're going in the opposite order. I thought we were going to develop the regs, lay out the standards and the procedures, and then the commission was going to vote to approve those by a vote of eight. Yeah, I'm a little concerned about the, the, the process as well because it seems like we're already deciding the outcome uh, despite the process. I mean, Commissioner Jacob, how is that not the case? Look, there's always... There's always good, good questions that can be asked, and there are always good answers that can be given. But it all remains lodged in theoretical discussion. The objective of this motion 
is to move forward finally after 10 years. We are mandated, mandated to provide such rules for the benefit of the public interest. What the arguments and the points that can be raised that are being raised now should be raised after staff finally puts on paper. As you know, I've said this several times during the meetings we've had of the confidentiality committee. I want to see it in writing, and then we can discuss it. You see, the objective here is to get it down in writing. All of the arguments you raise, Jose, and Monica is raising now, have been raised and re-raised for years. I'd like to see it in writing, and let's talk about it when the written document or the emails are before us and we can come to a rational conclusion. I'm not dismissing Monica's arguments. I've worked in law enforcement for many years. I know how important confidentiality is. So I don't need to be lectured about that. I know it. Nonetheless, it is important to get staff Staff to work on putting the motion, the regulation or the rule that is in this motion on paper, get it to us quickly, email it around before we even come to a meeting of the confidentiality committee. The intention is to bring this to the whole commission so we can expedite it. This committee stuff it hasn't worked for many, many years. Let's get the commission to work on this and to focus on this. Let Monica raise her point. Jose, you can raise yours. But let's get to a conclusion. Any other comment or question? Commissioner Weitzer. Um, yeah, we've been in uh, existence for 10 years and three days now. I have a question for uh, General Counsel Stam. During that period of time, has confidential information supplied by a law enforcement agency ever been released? Um, are you saying has the commission ever voted to authorize? No, I mean, I, you know, you 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 made us. You know, that we we were having this theoretical argument, which, quite frankly, uh, sort of turns my stomach, because. The way information has gone has been a one, almost a one-way street, and we have been castigated in public by, by a federal prosecutor when at the same time we're giving him information in the past. So while I recognize what has been raised by the chair and by you, I think it's more of a Trojan horse than anything else. This commission has acted responsibly for, for over 10 years now, and I don't think that's going to change by the adoption of this regulation. Thank you. All right, having had discussion on the uh, motion, I would ask for a roll call on the vote. Okay. On the, res uh, excuse me, on the motion, by Commissioner Jacob, we confirm the second. Commissioner Braun, I have as a second. Um, uh, Judge Braun. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner DePiro. Commissioner DePiro. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher. Yes. Commissioner Gersman. Yes. Judge Henricks. Uh, no. Commissioner Jacob. Yes. Commissioner Levine. Yes. Judge McCarthy. Yes. Commissioner McNamara. Yes. yes. Commissioner Weissman. Yes. Judge Yates. Yes. Commissioner uh, Chair Nieves. No. Motion carries 11 2. Do we 
I have a motion to. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Is there another? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. I have two motions. I will state the two motions and ask that the discussion be deferred to the January meeting. If that uh, comports with how you want to approach the situation. May I? Go ahead. The first motion is. The staff is directed to divulge to the full commission all inquiries made to review financial disclosure statements during the Cuomo administration by the Office of Inspector General for the executive chamber itself. The second motion is the staff is directed to request from the local administration, the names of all purported volunteers granted exemptions from the public officer's law pursuant to executive order 202.7, what those individuals' employment status was at the time they received the exemption, and whether any conflicts were discerned and what provision was made to address those conflicts. Thank you. And again, I ask that it be deferred to the January meeting. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. At this time, I'd like for a vote of I mean, a motion to re enter the session. So moved. Is there a second? There are second. A vote in favor. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing no opposition, we will move to executive session at this time. All right, thank you. All right, having this um, executive session, there's going to be some public announcements of action uh, taken during the executive session of the uh, commission. Uh, General Counsel Sam. Sorry. Um, the commission discussed matters related to litigation and le or legal advice, um, <clears throat> improved an application for an exemption from the post-employment restrictions person to 73-8-B, approved outside activity request person to Executive Law 94-16, approved a formal opinion um, person to Executive Law 94-16, commission commenced substantial and basis investigation, Commission authorized steps in several investigative matters, closed two matters, and discussed several other investigative matters. All right, thank you. Any other comments? All right, um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion made by Commissioner DePero, seconded by Commissioner Brown. All in favor? Any opposed? No opposition will move to adjourn. Uh, I wish you all a happy and healthy holiday and a happy new year. See you all next year. Same to you, Chair. Thank you. Same, Same to you and all. Happy, happy holidays. Take care, everybody. Happy holidays.